this week on the Faculty Factory Podcast. And if a learner is not having a good experience, it's nothing wrong with the learner. It is the responsibility of the faculty or the teacher. We assume responsibility by accepting a position in an academic place. If you don't want to be involved in teaching, then you should go to a non-academic place. And whatever little bit you do, it doesn't have to be a lot. It has to be done well. And you have to self-assess who you are, what skills you need to do it well, and pursue those skills in the same way you would your clinical skills. Teaching is a skill. Clinical care is a skill. Without practice and knowledge, you cannot do it well. It's not an innate thing that people just do. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast, friends. On today's episode, we have Dr. Alice Fornari, the Associate Dean for Educational Skills Development, Professor of Science, Education, Occupational Medicine, Epidemiology and Prevention, and Family Medicine, and Vice President for Faculty Development at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. You have all these hats and titles. So how I'm curious, and a lot of us are always curious, how we manage to get through uh, careers and find ourselves in some interesting places. So what is your journey into faculty affairs and faculty development? Well, I've had a really interesting journey because this is a second career for me. Um, It seems like I've been in this career, but it is a second career. So for 20 years, I taught college and I went to school as a student, graduate and undergraduate in nutrition. And that was my love. And I taught nutrition for 20 years at the college level. Along the way, I developed a passion for education and curriculum and learning and all the things that we do as faculty developers and work on. And I decided to get a doctorate in New York at Teachers College, one of the meccas of education, luckily was right in my backyard. And I was able to pursue the understanding of university education and administration with the goal of becoming dean at a college, honestly. Along the way, I met a physician who we just bonded and she told me I need to be in medical education. I didn't even know what medical education was. She was at Einstein Medical School And she actually pulled me along into this world of medical education, and I trusted her. So trust was a big feature of this. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, you think this is good for me? I'll try it. And this happened over a period of time, and then eventually she created a full-time position for me, and I was there six years working at Einstein Medical School at Montefiore Medical Center. Along the way, I met people starting this new medical school along Long Island, actually in my backyard of my home, basically. And they recruited me to come here and help start a new medical school. And I want to say to anybody on this phone, if you have the opportunity and logistically can help start a new medical school, it will be one of the highlights of your career because it's a wonderful opportunity to start something from scratch and be able to see 10 years out where we are with medical education here on Long Island at the Zucker School of Medicine, wow. and as well as the impact it's had on a large health system of 23 hospitals, Northwell Health. Okay, so you said at least uh, three or four things that I took notes of that are just fascinating to me. And the first is you said you wanted to be a dean of a college. Now, I got to say, you're probably one of the first persons that I've ever talked to who said you had, you had aspired to be a dean because I, most people I talk to say, I never in the world thought I'd ever be a dean or I had no idea I'd land here being a chair of this or a a dean, associate dean of that. How did, how did you arrive to that um, goal of wanting to be a dean of a college? So I've always been very academic and I wanted to be an academic dean to clarify that. 
And people always used to say to me, it's so funny, Kim, that you bring this up, because people used to say to me when I was in college life for 20 years, so you want to be a college president, right? And I'd say, no, never, because a college president is a fundraiser. Right. I do not like fundraising. It's I don't like asking people for money. Someone said once, how would you ask somebody for money? I said, I could never do that. <laughs> I could give somebody money. I could lend money, but I can't ask for money. So for me, a dean was a very academic person and had an academic leadership role. And that's where I wanted to go. And I didn't know about medical education. So it was just, that's my setting. And that's what I was going to do. And I wanted to influence change in higher education, learning and teaching, which I'm able to do now in medical education. The the second thing you'd said that kind of also struck me was this this MD, this doctor you met who influenced you and very quickly ascertained that you should go into medical education and you said, Yeah, she oh sure, I'll give it a try, I'll go there. Now how in the world did, did that happen? Over what period of time did this mentor get to know you and and see in you this either the skill that maybe you you had already had or you were developing or you had a talent for it. How did she identify this? And over what period of time had she known you when she suggested this? And then you said, okay. She didn't know me very well, um, to be honest. She actually met me on a job interview that I did, a position interview at Einstein. And they did not select me. And she met me and obviously liked me. And she kept my business card and kept in touch with me, even though I didn't get that position at that moment. And then she had some grant money. So she was able to fund me to do some things privately. And I took those opportunities. And that's a message I'd like to take, take forward is opportunities come your way and everybody is busy and overloaded. But most people who know me here really say no, because you don't know what an opportunity brings, mm -hmm. what door it opens. Yeah. So I said yes to her and did some private work for her and she got to know me. And then she said, you must be here with me full time. Wow. I'm like, okay. Then she had grant money, luckily, and was able to do that. And I made a very large decision to leave traditional higher ed and go into medical education. I did sit myself down after three years and say, do I want to live as a non-MD in an MD world? And you're a non-MD, so I think you can understand. I always say I'm a non-MD in an MD world because right. there's very few of us compared to the amount of MDs we have. That's right. And I said, I'm going to stay. And at that point, I figured out really how to begin to explode my career because wow. she had me a little isolated in some projects and I really had to figure out how to enter the real world of med ed. And that's how I met the people starting the Zucker School of Medicine because I was in a larger world of med ed by the time they were recruiting. That's another great example. I love that personal story of how being rejected for one thing is setting you up sometimes unbeknownst to ourselves for something bigger and better. So who knew that these opportunities where we feel rejected or denied or we lose the fill in the blank, the job, the grant, the paper, the position, the whatever, and recognizing and being aware of the fact that people are watching us, you know, and watching how we handle ourselves during those moments of you know, challenge and being rejected and how we handle that and how we, again, yours is a good example, taking an opportunity instead of pouting or allowing yourself to ha carry a grudge or get really down on yourself, you, you really, um, you know, took a deep breath and uh, move forward with this new opportunity and look at where it landed you. I mean, who knew? I, I love that story. So what's interesting, I still remember the email she sent me was, I met you on an interview, and I don't know if you remember me, but I want to talk to you again. And I'm like, thinking, you didn't give me the job. Like, why do you want to talk to me? You know, but <laughs> once again, I, I took that and I spoke to her and, you know, 
Yeah. We never really discussed exactly why I didn't get that position because it wasn't important to our relationship. Right. She was not the decision maker and she was just somebody interviewing me. So right. in the end, it, right, it yeah. all worked out. I got into faculty More development. More than worked out. Yeah, just falling backwards into it by the grace of God that I've, I think I've told the story in the podcast before, but I wasn't getting an R01 and and uh, those of us who didn't have full salary coverage by fund by um, NIH grants or any grants were going to have our salaries cut in half. And so just circuitously, I ended up and fortuitously also got this opportunity to start and run a new mentoring program at Rush University Medical Center with Dr. Ali Keshavarzian, a gastroenterologist mm-hmm. who's a, a lovely man. And it was just going to cover my salary temporarily. I mean, here I was a gerontologist doing my research, sitting in my office all day by myself, analyzing data, writing papers, writing grant applications like a crazy person, and nothing was happening for me along the grant line. And uh, then this faculty development thing came up that I'd never even really had any idea what faculty development was. And here I am, you know, 13 years later, living the best life ever and, um, doing exactly what I know I was meant to do. And it's all because I was rejected time and time again by NIH, NIA in particular. Thank you very much, National Institute on Aging. And um, somebody saw in me an opportunity to run this program and boom, here I am. You have obviously this deep background in education and a passion for faculty development that's that's over your career that's really blossomed and moved you into this space of building and creating brand new programming at a brand new medical college. Uh, what kinds of, um, I'm sure there's so much you could share with us today, but what would you like to um, impart to us and talk with us about today? So my approach to faculty development um, that I've learned through my experience, because, you know, obviously it had to be learned um, it was very different than traditional higher ed, is that I'm working with clinicians. And I just want to say something about Northwell. I work with physicians, but I also work with nurses and PAs and, you know, many different professions. Interprofessional education is very powerful today. Everybody who's seen patients is very, very busy and have a stress that an educator alone does not have because they're responsible for people's lives. There's never going to be a medical emergency in faculty development, Mm -hmm. but there is a medical emergency with patients. So like I always have to, I go with that reality check with every I do. Okay. So it allows me to have increased flexibility and patience within the faculty development world that I work in. And I think that's very important. And I think people recognize that I respect those additional roles that everybody has. Now, at the same time, though, I do feel I'm in a very academic place, be it the medical school or the health system, that people who have learned is in front of them are taking a responsibility to be serious about the teaching and learning that happens with those learners. And if a learner is not having a good experience, it's nothing wrong with the learner. It is the responsibility of the faculty or the teacher that it is. We assume responsibility by accepting a position in an academic place. If you don't want to be involved in teaching, then you should go to a non-academic place. But if you've signed on in my milieu of where I live, there will be a responsibility towards education And whatever little bit you do, it doesn't have to be a lot. It has to be done well. And you have to self-assess who you are, what skills you need to do it well, and pursue those skills in the same way you would your clinical skills. Mm. Teaching is a skill. Clinical care is a skill. Without practice and knowledge, you cannot do it well. It's not an innate thing that people just do. And I'm asking people mainly to self-assess who they are, their roles, what skills they need, pursue those skills, and I offer opportunities in many ways. That's something I've learned. The type of faculty development I have to order has to be diverse in delivery styles, diverse in content, and very relevant to who's in front of me. 
So what I do with surgeons is very different than what I do with primary care doctors. Can you give us an example off uh, off the cuff here if you, you're you going to be working with those two disparate groups? What, what might that content or delivery look like? So, for example, if I'm working with primary care doctors who do a lot of ambulatory care, right? I mean, they, they don't do as much inpatient care. Then I really target my faculty development to skills they can use in the very, very busy ambulatory care settings where what are they seeing, 20 patients in an afternoon or something. So I really target that, and I'm respectful of how much they can accomplish with their learners and how to capsulize the learning moments. Mm -hmm. And just little basic skills, like a moment of reflection at the end of the day saying to a learner, so what's one new thing you got from being in the learning environment today? Little things. Mm -hmm. If I'm working with a group of surgeons or surgical specialties, I better be talking about teaching procedures, intense skill development through deliberate practice and adaptive expertise, and what to do when you have a learner in the OR, how to gain trust, how to offer them an opportunity to do something that's within their challenge level that they should be challenged, so understanding challenge and how much support to give to that learner, because that's a very high-stakes situation, the OR. The learner can do something, but we have to understand how high the challenge is and how much support you're giving and to really see where your learner is going to be to have psychological safety to learn. Mm -hmm. So for me, that is a very important concept of surgical procedure and OR teaching. So that's two different worlds of teaching. Right. Wow. And how how have you observed changes over time. Have you seen any trends that you are interested in or curious about or how has your um, philosophy in medical education evolved over the years? Well, I love being in front of learners. I thrive. I have a passion for teaching. As I said, I taught college for 20 years. That was many hours of teaching over semesters and summers. So I love having learners in front of me, in the room with me, number one. But I am learning to adapt to a world of technology and trying to put some of the things I love online. Yeah. And it's a reality that we need to use technology today. People just can't come all the time, especially with geographic dispersion. And people need access from where they are. And I can't be where everybody is. So I am moving to some online education through um, different systems, be it email, be it webinars, be it, you know, all the stuff we do, courses online. And I am trying to put my material, but everything synchronous. I've not moved into the asynchronous world. So I am doing my online education synchronously. Yeah. And maybe one day I'll go asynchronous. Right now I'm baby stepping into synchronous faculty development using technology. Yeah, I, I just just yesterday got an email from one of our part-time faculty. At Hopkins, we have about 3,000 full-time faculty and about 2,000 part-time faculty members. And they're and, very similar to us here, very yeah. similar numbers to what we have. Exactly. exactly. So, so you, you know, we all have these same challenges where – a big email blast went out to all faculty at Hopkins and, and it listed just an email bullet point list of the upcoming faculty development opportunities coming up, including things like the new faculty orientation, promotion sessions, time management sessions, workshops on building your clinical practice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, about 12 or 14 things. And a part-time faculty member emailed me and said, are we ever going to get these online for us who are part-time faculty in the clinic all day um, to, to take, to, you know, participate in this. And so part of my, you know, my initial instinct was like, oh no, you know, this message is still not out there because about half of that content or maybe three quarters has already been archived and recorded and that are on our website for viewing at any point in time. I mean, we do these things every year. So, 
things like promotion sessions, we, we record those sessions and, and update those links every year. Some of the other things we only record every couple of years. But then, so I, I, you know, took, took a moment, took a breath. Cause it's, you know, you're, you're so frustrated because I could feel her when she capitalized ever. I thought, Oh no, she has no awareness of this. So, but then I got to thinking, uh, Wow, like you said, this humility and this sensitivity to the fact that these, our faculty members are so, so stretched and so busy and so their, their hearts are in, in the, in this, this wonderful place of wanting to take care of patients and wanting to do their best. And, and they're running after their life's passion of, of providing care and healing patients. And they also, they get this on this, you know, this need to be good educators and researchers and, and community builders and administrators, they understand that, but they're so frustrated by the lack of time and the, um, the, the pressures and these competing demands. And so I, I emailed her some links and, and reassured her that, you know, here's, these are things online already. And she said, okay, great. I didn't know about this, but can you make these, uh, an hour? No, we, we can't do anything longer than an hour. And then I, I kind of, I looked down the list and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, there were only about two or three of these things that were an hour long. And a lot of them were workshopped kinds of things, two and three, and a couple of them are four hour workshops where they're doing small, gr- small group breakouts and, and pair and share kinds of act- activities. And how do you record something like that where there's a lot of interaction and interactivity going on? So it, it really kind of, again, a, a sense of my like, oh my gosh, I'm just, it's, it, I never feel like I'm doing enough. And the idea of taking a program or a resource, a, a resource and packaging it 10 different ways, you know, in little sound bites or a, a 15 minute Instagram or Twitter feeds and, and PowerPoints and webinars and, how do you, you know, it's, it's a constant churn of trying to maneuver and meet people where they are. I'm sure you have a lot of the same um, anxiety and frustration I have with, with this, my feeling like I'm not doing enough. I always feel like I'm not doing enough. And that's why, you know, I went into the electronic world because I had to reality check myself and it's not perfect. And I'm constantly trying to work on improvement. I am big in favor of the synchronous electronic world because one thing I'm always trying to do, Kim, is build community. And building community is possible online if we are able to form cohorts of people that have a common interest. I always say to a department, give me one that want to do education. You don't have to give me everyone. I don't need everyone. I just need some champions. So I just launched a new um, email faculty development called Just in Time Teaching Tips, and I have a champion in every department that's using it. And I asked that champion to identify a, a resident that could work with them because my product is geared towards residents and faculty. So, you know, identifying one or two people in an area is more satisfying than trying to cultivate a whole team of busy clinicians. So that's something I'm trying to do within form small communities of interest in the work that I'm trying to do in terms of teaching and learning. Yeah. Now, I, I remember that presentation. Well, how do you get those champions and those influencers? Well, I actually, you know, I have a very good relationship, luckily, with chairs and program directors. And that's really fortunate. So chairs know me as well as program directors. I don't work with chairs regularly, but if I want to ask a chair a question, you know, they're accessible to me, but the program directors I see all the time. And I had a program director text me this morning and ask me a question about just-in-time teaching. So that's a really important thing. So the the program directors gave me champions. I, I said, you must have one faculty member who would be interested in this. Don't force it on somebody. Pick somebody. And actually, I asked them to go to people they generally don't pick when I start a new project. So it's the same people over and over. They're burnt out. Right. Give me somebody that maybe mentioned to you, I'm looking for something to do and, you know, or a little bit of a twist in what I do. You know, find me that hidden person, not the person you always ask. And our departments, are, fortunately, are pretty large here. So there are people that are unnoticed that are not been tapped. 
And we need to go to those people more because the same six people are always asked to do something. <laughs> right. Now, right. just out of curiosity, do these are these uh, champions reimbursed or compensated or have some kind of a title or some no. resources or this additional uncompensated effort? It's an uncompensated effort, but if they see it as positive for their clinical area, I think they feel good. And I do offer to help them make everything I do scholarship so they can disseminate it through their own professional world, be it obstetrics, gynecology, medicine, pediatrics, whatever it is. So I do offer them opportunity to do scholarship. We are an academic place, so scholarship is on the buzz of every chairperson. That's right. So it's really important for the faculty to be doing some form of scholarship, and I try to be helpful. I'm currently a full professor, so I don't have to worry about my own scholarship as much. I just have to help other people. And that's going into another passion I have is mentoring. For me, helping other people get to the next step, whatever the next step is for that person, is a real goal I have. And you know, I was talking to a very junior faculty member yesterday that I'm mentoring through a woman and mentoring program we have at um, Northwell. And she's going to a professional meeting and I'm mentoring on her to have, find her niche. It's a very large professional meeting nationally. She's young. Like, how does she find a niche there? Who does she talk to? Who does she network with about the same interest? So I really try and help people do that. So one of my big roles is mentoring for educational scholarship and career development. And people are very grateful for that. Um, and therefore, that also entices them to help me. When I ask a request, people are eager to help me because they know I want to be helpful to them. Now, uh, before I go into mentoring, uh, this the educational scholarship and how you, you encourage this with your uh, champions, do th- is it your um, experience at Northwell that you have, that faculty have administrative support or research support in their own departments or maybe through your faculty development office? Do you have uh, research assistant types or admin- administrative support to help faculty collect data, analyze it, uh, write it up, database maintenance? I'm, I'm curious how that happens operationally or or is everything on the faculty members themselves to um, push through? Pretty much everything is on the faculty members. It's up to department chairs to give protected time to faculty. Um, it's nothing. Mo- I, I work out of the Office of Academic Affairs, which is a corporate central office, but chairs decide that. We are having a major discussion at Northwell about academic RVUs. Mm. It's a new area for us here of the generating units for academic work. That's a brand new discussion here. It's actually, um, we're bringing an outsider in to have a presentation on this for our academy medical educators. And we don't currently have a system of academic RVUs, but there is discussion. Wow. But all faculty are expected to do educational, um, um, some type of research. Some do clinical, some could do education. So every department chair expects scholarship. What level of scholarship depends somewhat on the breakdown between clinical time, administrative time, and research time. Every faculty member negotiates that individually. There's no set formula. Got it. Now, do you also, through the Office of Academic Affairs or in your mentoring role and your, or your, your background in education, do you also, uh, help the faculty members learn about research and education methods, or are, the, are your faculty coming to you pretty well trained in how to write a paper? No, they're very novice, many of them, and I do run an annual course on educational research, so I'm sure you're familiar, you know, with the Merck course, the Medical Education right. Research Certificate that AAMC offers. I had graduated that program, and um, I have my own course here. It's face-to-face. And it's actually going to be offered for the first time in January synchronously online. So we'll all be online together. They'll have a choice of classroom or synchronous. I've had a big request for this over the years. So I'm going there finally. And I must say that that course starts with how to ask a research question and ends with how to write a publication. And it's about eight sessions 
long, two hours each. So Mm -hmm. it's a 16 hour course that runs generally over January, February into mid March about. And I run that course annually. And I encourage people to come to that course with a project, take all the sessions and work through their project idea from beginning, not obviously having a paper at the end, but just work through the project. And we do quantitative collection, qualitative. We do all aspects of research. That course um, is a setup for educational research. The Research Institute at my place has another course that parallels that on clinical research. Mine is educational research. And um, that's been very helpful um, to get a certificate from that course, meaning an internal certificate from Northwell, um, requires that they take um, 80% of the sessions that I offer. And do the faculty members get um, release time to participate in your course? I run my courses generally from 7 to 9 a.m., so oh. it's actually a little bit before the workday starts that they can do this. I found where my culture here, the best time for me to offer anything is 7 to 9 a.m. That's good to know. I always get that question all the time. What's the best time? What's the best time? And for us, we've really not found any any best time. So I always... Well, there's no best the time, but for me, the most likely thing that people show up for is 7 to 9 a.m. Wow. And that obviously doesn't impact any child care issues. Do you have on-site child care there at Northwell? No, but it does impact people who have child care issues, but the end of the day also impacts people with child care issues. So it seems that coverage is a little easier in the morning. The people that it really impacts are hospitalists and surgeons. Mm -hmm. So surgeons who operate early, and then I have a problem with that hour with hospitalists who are doing rounds. So hospitalists do better later in the day. Interesting. Now, now I'm just, it just kind of begs the question, do you also offer or have you ever tried things after the work day or is that too much infringement? I on have, time? but, you know, like 4.30 to 6 or 4 to 6 at the end of the day yeah. on occasion. But what I find is schedule coming in the day gets so crazy they don't show up. Yeah. So I have more non-shows at the end of the day. Yeah. Honestly. I've often thought about, you know, I get so many requests to do retreats, you know, internally at our own institution and, and external um, requests to do retreats. And they often end up being where people want to do them on, well, the facilitators want to do them on Saturday mornings or weekends. And, you know, the, the push pull of that is, especially with clinicians, they don't have time during the week to leave uh, the patients to do a retreat. But then you have this whole burnout and joy in medicine thing feet push back saying, wait a minute, you want us to have more joy and less burnout, but you're scheduling a weekend away from our family to do a retreat. So I've often wondered uh, maybe once, twice a year to do a boot camp kind of a faculty development thing where it is on like a Saturday morning from, you know, 7 to 11. I've, I've thought the same thing, Kim. I've, I've, I've actually thought about the same thing here. I thought about this educational research skills development course I offer. That's the name of it. And I thought about doing that on a Saturday morning as a boot camp, all the sessions together, even though the learning would be so condensed. I don't think it's educationally sound, but as a way to do it. But I'm trying the synchronous online system first. That might be a next step, but I'm going to the synchronous online because I do feel Saturday morning is a very, very big intrusion. Also, I'll get pushback if it's an Orthodox community of yeah. in Judaism that it's on the Sabbath. So people won't like that. You know, there's always something. Right. So I, I do run an online medical education journal club monthly, and everybody can be anywhere they are. And I offer that monthly, and I do one article a month. And I do do that from 12 to 1. And I pick that period because... There is sometimes a break in the clinic at that time, and people in clinic can show up, and also morning rounds are usually over by then. And I've had very good attendance from 12 to 1 um, for Medical Education Journal Club on a monthly basis. When I initially started, I also ran it from 5 to 6, 
and I had very few people sign up, or if they signed up, they were in the car driving home, and they couldn't really participate in the journal club because I try to make that interactive with discussion. Yeah. <sighs> That's great stuff. Now, now I want to um, switch back to your mentoring because I know you, you uh, love mentoring, and that's also near and dear to your heart. What did you do to learn mentoring? Did you yourself participate in any kind of coursework or self-learning? Uh, did you just pick this up through having good mentorship yourself? I'm, I'm always curious of how people mentor. What is their style? Is it like a coaching, sponsoring, um, therapist? What is, how would you describe your mentoring style and how you got to that? My mentoring style is definitely coaching, 100%. I also sponsor. So, for example, even all the time, I, I, I just had a, I just ran a webinar for IAMC, the International Association of Medical Education, on, you know, a kickoff webinar on faculty development for IAMC. They had a whole series coming up, and I did the lead-off. And then after that, the person who designs the webinars in general, said, we have a webinar coming up on this topic. We need some speakers. Do you know anybody? And I I sponsored somebody from my institution to speak on one of the topics. So, so that's, to me, sponsorship, when you recommend somebody specifically for something. I do mentor this person also in terms of their medical education. He happens to have actually finished my master's program in health professions, pedagogy, and leadership that I direct. So I know him very well because not only was he interested in medical education, he did my master's trying to sponsor him for different medical education opportunities outside of Northwell so he gets a credential as a um, a career in medical education away from Northwell. So that's sponsorship. My mentoring skills really come from the mentors I've had. I've had amazing mentors in my career, and I think my skills in mentoring and my passion for mentoring has come from that. I do feel very strongly that entering is a dialogue and a relationship and the mentee has a role as well as the mentor. And my most successful relationships are when mentees understand that. So I am not an authoritative mentor. I am somebody who wants to work on it as a relationship and a building process. And I get as much from my mentees as I give to my mentees. So it's, very much a collaborative relationship and really something where the excitement comes when I see a young person, which fortunately I see a lot of of people I'm mentoring who are moving forward. And I do do sponsorship as much as I can. I'm into sponsorship, which is the next step above mentoring where I literally recommend somebody. So for example, for 10 years here, I was co-directing the communication film from before we opened till this June. I decided to give that up. I just felt I had my time with that. And I sponsored the person who got the, mm. the co-directorship of that. And I handpicked that person to take on that role. And they took my recommendation. And I wasn't the decision maker. But they did it. And now I'm watching her grow in that role because I teach in that curriculum still. And it is such a thrill for me to watch her developing. And she's, you know, young. She's the same age as one of my children, you know, 40 years old. So it's really exciting when you have a great mentoring relationship. I don't know how I would live without being a mentor. And I don't know how I would live without having mentors. And I have mentors at Northwell and I have mentors outside of Northwell, still mainly at Einstein where I used to be. Yeah, I, I love that story. And I, a couple of things I love about what you said is the, the first thing was how you had come to a point where you decided that you no longer wanted to lead that initiative and decided that your time was done. And so I'm always curious of how people, how long sometimes people hang on to things and when they decide the time is right and, I'm sure we've all seen some people who hang on to things a little bit longer than you you maybe wish they would would have hung on. But I like how you um, described and saying it was time for someone else and that you had 
obviously then identified one of your mentees and really enjoyed watching her um, blossom into that, that role. Um, and I can't remember the other, the other thing that you said that um, I really liked. It'll probably come to me in a second here. No, I can't, I can't think of what it was. It'll, it'll, it'll roll back around in my head, but I, but I have to say my message is everybody needs a mentor, whatever stage of career you're at. And if you have the ability to mentor others, it's, it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful resilience builder. I feel mentoring is a resilience builder. That was it, Alice. Yeah. Thank you. You totally triggered me this when you, um, when you talked about mentoring, how you still have mentors, we, we, we beat our faculty about the head with you must, you must, you must have a mentor and not just one, but many and peer mentors counts and people who are content mentors and career mentors. And so we, we talk about this all the time and still we find people who, when we begin any kind of programming or go to a meeting or we'll ask for a show of hands and there still are people who don't have mentors and so, you know, for various reasons, who knows what, but I still suspect that there are people out there who think that having a mentor is um, a sign of, of weakness, or perhaps there's some kind of stigma, like you need someone to help you. So I, I agree with you that we have to change some people who, for whatever reason, feel that that is uh, almost like having a, uh, a counselor or a therapist that, you know, that if we all talk about, as you obviously are doing now, our own mentoring experiences, being mentored, that that changes that culture of, no, this is just an expectation. We, all wise leaders and all people throughout their careers, especially leaders, should acknowledge or, or will, will acknowledge that they've had, that they are where they are by good mentors. And almost everyone without exception on this podcast has also spoken to experiences of uh, they didn't, you know, scrap and fight to get to these positions by themselves. It was mentors who guided them and sponsored them and coached them and encouraged them. So that was the second thing. I love that you, you again are, are um, making sure you're having that call of the importance of mentoring and, and reminding all of us that we have to remind our faculty members that this is also an expectation in higher education and academic medicine. It's very important that we all have mentors at, surrounding us at all different levels. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question. Okay, Alice, I remember you talking about um, humanities and how important that is to you. Uh, did you want to ta um, talk to the podcast community about um, how you feel health humanities are involved in the work we do? Well, it's so interesting because it's not like I come from a humanities background. I was a nutrition major, very heavy science, you know, very focused on biochemistry. And, you know, so it's not like this was natural for me. But I think when I got involved in medical education, there was so much storytelling with patients and the impact of illness stories on clinicians that somehow I got involved in this sort of storytelling and partly um, through some work at Montpure with a clinician who developed a um, online sort of magazine blog called Pulse Voices from the Heart of Medicine that I'm deeply involved in at this point. But early on, the idea of putting stories on and learning through stories of clinicians. And I got intrigued in this and, of course, self-educated myself. And there are listservs involved with medical humanities. And I always had an interest also in ethics and ethical decision-making and bioethics. So I do have a certificate now in bioethics that I did just recently in the last three years. But that always was also cases and stories and impacted decision-making. So then I got involved in the whole world of looking at health humanities, which was is actually transferring to that term now from medical humanities to be more inclusive, 
because of our interprofessional focus, medical and prize physicians, mm-hmm. that I got into the whole world of art education through, you know, using art to educate about observation skills and improve observation skills, and then using poems that physicians have written or non-physicians have written or clinicians have written, so much poetry out there, and then there's, you know, obviously stories, and then many, many um Nonfiction books. I mean, there's a, how many clinicians have written books? Um, mm-hmm. All types of clinicians and so many uh, incredible reading of, of dealing with uh, either tragedy in their own life or tragedy in patients' lives. Unfortunately, usually they focus on um, very devastating experiences that people have had. And then you know, looking at movies and looking at, you know, podcasts. And actually, my students are the ones who have told me that podcasts, Netflix, and um, um, TED Talks are humanities. So I've included them. <laughs> so I run a fourth year elect. They told me that, and I need to listen to my younger learners and get on board. So I run a fourth year elective a longitudinal elective in fourth year. It meets weekly and we use all different types of humanities to look at illness stories or health stories. And um, I do include the podcast, um, TED Talks and Netflix, and I include one book and I include poetry and I include narrative. And um, I have a fac- co-faculty facilitator, a different person each week. I've cultivated a group of faculty quite large who have an interest in this and love teaching. They find this a resilience building activity to teach through the humanities and they love humanities for different reasons in their life. Some of them were humanities majors in college and are going back to their roots, even though they're physicians or nurses today. And some just see the power of the humanities. So I have about a nice collaborative community that works with me on this and deliver these sessions. I do accommodate the students since their fourth years, and this is the flexibility issue. And I offer the sessions face-to-face and also with an online capability. Some of the clinicians are upset with the online capability, and I try to explain to them about the need to be flexible and accommodate students wherever they are because many of them are off-site in fourth year. Wow. Talk about innovative. I that is fabulous that you have brought up an issue that I've been really curious about is younger generations, new learners, pushing us to meet them where they are with learning on demand. And this is great. Podcast, Netflix, TED Talks for storytelling. That That is also really hits with what you talked about earlier, building community. That's my big thing, too, is building small communities of engagement. And I, some, I worry uh, that we we're so isolated and our faculty are so isolated and some of my reticence of going online. And as you mentioned earlier, doing webinars and, and standing by myself in a studio recording things when I too, like you, I'm used to being with people and students and teaching together in a room and connecting personally when you're in a studio or recording by yourself or talking into your, your microphone, it's, it's a lonely endeavor. And so I like this, uh, I worry, I, I guess I worry about everything going to technology and being asynchronous that we, we lose that sense of community that is so important to you and, and me and a lot of other people. And, and that this, this, this idea of storytelling and bringing health humanities, I think is a really reassuring way to me to feel like, okay, wait a minute. People still do enjoy getting together and, and telling stories and sharing other aspects of life and hearkening back to, as you said, things that brought us joy as children and as young, young students. So I like that kind of full circle that you've built in there and how you've um, woven that, that thread of personal connection and community in your, in your work. It was very funny that last Tuesday, this past Tuesday night, when I ran the session, I was with my co-faculty member who happens to be a, a holistic nurse practitioner and all the students were online just by chance. Usually we have some in the session with us, but they were all online. 
So it was me and the faculty member in the session with all the students online. And we did great with Zoom because I, I, you know, we saw everybody and we had such a rich conversation about professional identity development and what it means. And um, they t- each told stories about experiences. It was, I got out of there. It was so, it, this was six to eight at night. So this is not, this is the end of the day that I do this. I do this in the evening. And it was so exhilarating, even with the online. It was just, I left there so much stronger than when I came in the room at six o'clock at night, you know, really? sort of like unbelievable. Well, that, Very powerful. That that is that is really reassuring to me, and I'm getting a little bit excited because I have to be honest that I'm 54, and so when people talk about technology, I kind of feel my guts get all, you know, I get panicky. Because well, I'm 67. I'm 67. So all right. well, I'm, I'm a, I just, num- I I'm a decade like, ahead of you. I hate this technology. I mean, right now we're, we're um, I've told people before I'm in my basement. And I, every time I do in my house doing these podcasts, I freak out. I get so nervous because I hate technology and I swear my body is full of magnets that I just, you know, ruin everything technology. So people start talking about all these new educational techniques and approaches. And I, and again, I get that same kind of, and my stomach starts getting all flippy and crazy and, I have a hard time, you know, linking to a stinking YouTube if I want to do something during a course. So I, I panic about this, this technology. But the fact that you've just described this Zoom experience, um, I, I kind of get suspicious and skeptical. I'm like, how can you have a conversation with that many people when you're not even in the room? Because I'm one of these people who on a conference call, my you know, head explodes when the person leading the conference call says, how's everybody doing today? And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? There are like 40 of us on the phone and you just put a question out like that. And then, you know, a third of the people will start talking and it makes me nuts. So I, I'm, I don't know what it is about me or my personality type, but I get panicky. So the way you just described this as being exhilarating and knowing and trusting that you've come from this educational background in a traditional university does give me hope that maybe um, it's encouraging me to think, well, maybe if Alice is doing this and it, it's working for her and feeling good, that maybe I could do it. I want to tell you, I was a non-believer, and I have to say, leaving that session, I never thought the session could work well um, with the topic we were doing, but I have to take what comes in front of me. All the students were online that night, and I'm a non-believer that's you know, slowly being converted. And without that flexibility, I wouldn't be having these sessions. So that's what I say to my faculty who are resistant. If we don't move with the tide, we're not going to have the students in front of us. And if it has to be through Zoom, we have to make the best of what we can do. And I must say, you know, I get petrified every time I'm signing on to Zoom, if you want to know the truth. Is it going to work? Am I, am I audio okay? Am I camera okay? You know, I have a moment of trepidation. So, but I have to say that I'm... Um, I can't imagine doing health humanities online, and I am doing it, and I'm doing the best I can. Is it exactly the same as being all in the room together? No, it, but it's the best of what I can do to make it happen, and um, I feel committed to keep trying to improve it and work with my faculty, so I think it is something as faculty developers we need to embrace and move forward with. Yeah. Wow. You so inspired me. I got to admit, I mean, that's, you're the first person who has made me feel like I can do this. I mean, I really do. I I have this mental pushback when someone starts talking about this stuff. I have this, you know, metaphorical and real eye roll and the sick to my stomach feeling, but you really inspired me to, to do this. And I am willing to share my curriculum with anybody who's interested. Um, I'm a very big person on sharing. There's no reason to reinvent wheels. Oh, that's so (laughs) generous. Thank you, Alice. Well, you've you've really inspired me, and I'm sure I'm not the only person here who's been listening to you with a bunch of ideas about what I can do back at my institution. Would you like to leave us with any last wisdom or encouragement or any um, comments or shout-outs to anyone out there in Faculty Factory Podcast land? 
So if you ever are questioning yourself and what am I doing and you need to reignite your passion, which everybody probably does. Um, obviously, I'm a very passionate person. I turn on a YouTube of Parker Palmer. He's one of my idols in education and listening to Parker Palmer about what is education. He's not a medical educator, but he is respected in the medical education world. There's a graduate medical education award after him. I turn on Parker Palmer and listen to him. So I suggest that you um, self-assess yourself and keep your passion going. And that passion with humility, not with arrogance, but with humility and respect will get you very far in your career as a faculty developer. That is beautiful. Very well said. Thank you so much, Alice. This has been really a great conversation. Friends, you've been listening to Dr. Alice Fornari at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.